Thank you for listening to this podcast from TRE. Talk Radio Europe, your voice in Spain and around the world. For more information, please visit tre.radio. The TRE Book Show is sponsored by audible.co.uk. Download one title each month, plus unlimited listening to thousands of Audible originals, podcasts and audiobooks. Just click on the Audible banner at www.tre.radio. The Book Programme, presented by Hannah Murray. Good evening, welcome to tonight's book show. We start by looking at the bestseller lists on Amazon.co.uk and the Sunday Times, the oldest and most influential book sales chart in the UK. Then we'll be chatting to Graham Bartlett. His first non-fiction book, Death Comes Knocking, was a Sunday Times bestseller, co-written with the best-selling author Peter James. His latest novel, starring Chief Superintendent Joe Howe, is City on Fire. He draws on his experiences of 30 years in the police force and being chief of police for Brighton and Hove. Then we're chatting to Susan Elkin, who's a former English teacher who's been a professional author, journalist and critic for over 30 years. Her latest book, All Booked Up, is a memoir on 70 years of reading. It reflects on marriage, motherhood, vegetarianism and grief through books. We're also chatting to Rosie Hewlett, who studied a first-class honours degree in classical literature and civilization at the University of Birmingham. She studied Greek mythology in depth and is passionate about unearthing strong female voices within the classical world. Her latest novel, Medea, is a mythology retelling which explores ancient Greece's most powerful and complex woman. That's just the first hour. In the second hour, we're chatting to Ellie Griffiths, CJ Barker, Nick McLaughlin and Ashley Wright. The Book Programme. Presented by Hannah Murray. Good evening. Welcome to The Book Show. At first, we take a look at the Sunday Times bestseller list, the oldest and most influential book sales chart in the UK, and the one that every author wants to be on. The chart is the most accurate and comprehensive estimation of book sales in the country. So this week's bestsellers, the prolific thriller writer James Patterson is back, claiming the top of the fiction hardbacks chart with the 24th hour. The last time he took that position, Position was in April 2022 with Run, Rose, Run. That was the literary duet with Tennessee's finest Dolly Parton. World Book Day in the UK was last week and that event ensured that the best-selling book of the week was a children's title, Greg the Sausage Roll Lunchbox Superhero. They've done well, haven't they? So looking at general hardbacks, three new entries from last week, including number one. In fact, it's the top three. Number one is The Trading Game by Gary Stevenson, the rags to riches memoir of a former city trader and why he gave it all up. Number two, The House of Hidden Meanings by RuPaul, how a gay black boy in San Diego became an international drag superstar. Number three, The Goddess Path by Kirsty Gallagher, inner exploration and self-discovery tips to reawaken the goddess within you. Then we have number four this week, Truth Be Told by Linda Robson. Number five is Crypt by Alice Roberts. Number six, My Mother and I by Ingrid Seward. Number seven, Drawn to the Garden by Caroline Quentin. Number eight, Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before by Julie Smith. Number nine, Wild Hope by Donna Ashworth. And number 10 is The Radfords Making Life Count by Sue Radford and Noel Radford. Looking at fiction hardbacks, three new entries from last week. At number one, as I said, is The 24th Hour by James Patterson and Maxine Pietro. Number two, The Island Swimmer by Lorraine Kelly. Number three is a new entry called The Warm Hands of Ghosts by Catherine Arden. A nurse receives news her brother has died in combat, but something doesn't add up. Number four is Never Too Late by Danielle Steele. 
Number five, The Women by Kristin Hanna. Number six, The Last Devil to Die by Richard Osman. Number seven is The List of Suspicious Things by Jenny Godfrey. Number eight is another new entry, The Sunlit Man by Brandon Sanderson. Nomad lands on a new planet whose inhabitants run from deadly sunlight. Number nine, Our Fair Lily by Rosie Goodwin. And number 10, a new entry, The Dream Home by T.M. Logan, a household secrets new owners wish had remained hidden. Looking at Amazon.co.uk, there's a definite Easter theme running through a lot of the books. At number one is Dog Man 12, The Scarlet Shedder by Dav Pilkey. Number two, there's A Little Chick in Your Book. That's number 14 in the Who's in Your Book series by Tom Fletcher. Number three, Fluffy Chick, an Easter touch and feel book by Rod Campbell. Number four is The Housemaid by Frieda McFadden. Number five, The Dinosaur That Pooped Easter, an excellent lift the flap adventure by Dougie Pointer. Number six, Bluey, Hooray, It's Easter, a lift the flap book. Number seven, The Housemaid's Secret by Frieda McFadden. Number eight is Atomic Habits by James Clear. Number nine this week, A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass. And at number ten, Peter Rabbit, The Great Big Easter Egg Hunt by Beatrix Potter. The Book Programme, presented by Hannah Murray. You're listening to The Book Club on Talk Radio Europe. And keep listening. That's an instruction from Margaret Thatcher. Joining us on the line now is Graham Bartlett, whose first non-fiction book, Death Comes Knocking, was a Sunday Times bestseller, co-written with the best-selling author Peter James. He's since published Bad for Good, starring Chief Superintendent Joe Howe. He's also worked on TV dramas, including ITV's recent Annika. He's with us on the book show to talk about his latest novel City on Fire. It's the much anticipated follow up to Bad for Good and Force of Hate and delivers more explosive crime in the dark underbelly of Brighton. Welcome to the book show, Graham. Thank you very much. So lovely to be invited. Ah, it's great to have you with us. So how did you go from non fiction to fiction? What happened there? I think it just felt like a natural progression. I, I'd written two non fictions with Peter and uh, they're hard work non-fictions. You know, you have to you have to get everything right, particularly when you deal with some of the subjects that I deal with. You know, you have to treat, make sure you treat people and victims with respect and uh, and all, all those things. And I, I just kind of had stories burning inside of me, and I just felt, well, I'll I'll, I'll give um, I'll give fiction a go. And, and it was it, it was no no easier, but um, uh, certainly I, I I really enjoy kind of creating. I enjoy creating Joe Howe. Uh, you know, I put her in a place that I knew very well, but the whole world around her I, I loved all that so yeah that, that's I think where my um my writing will stay now yeah so how did you come to work with Peter initially so I was in the police um for, for 30 years and, and my last job was as the um, police chief for, for Brighton and Hove uh, and Peter had an arrangement with with our force that he could come in and, and see how policing works so that he could reflect it fairly in his books and it was it was through that that we we met. You know, I, I had him at, at, at Brighton, and we used to let him go out with officers and that. And and he, slowly he became a friend of mine. And uh, and we we kind of just discussed when after I left the police, you know, writing a nonfiction. He was quite keen to write a nonfiction about the stories that inspired Roy Grace. I had no idea. I had no notion of being a writer at all. But mm-hmm. he'd seen some blogs I'd written and thought, well, I could probably. I could probably help this guy <laughs> transform his writing into a commercial style, and and that's how it happened. And um, yeah, we we brought out Death Comes Knocking. It became a instant Sunday Times top ten bestseller, and um, haven't looked back. Oh, fantastic! You've also done some writing with Ellie Griffiths as well. She was on the book show with me last week. <laughs> I help I help Ellie with her um, with, with, with with her books. With you know particularly. The, the Ruth Galloway books, um, and she's delightful. I mean, she she's you know she she gives as much to me, more to me than I give back to her. But um, that, it was interesting working with Ellie because she's you know her Ruth Galloway series had been running quite some time, and she'd already created characters and, and, and stories in the world, etc. So the advice that I give to her, as I give to to about 150 other authors, was you know let's work with the story that you've got and and get the 
get the, the, the procedure and, and, and the policing as authentic as it can be to support your story. But, um, yeah, she's, she, she's an amazing human being and a fabulous writer as well. Mm. So, I mean, it's very important, isn't it, when people are writing about police procedures, um, kind of two things. One, not to get bogged down in all the procedural work and the paperwork and that kind of thing. But at the same time, it needs to be authentic. And the information that they're giving as to, as to who does what and when needs to, you know, ring true. Yeah, and no, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I, I, it's certainly not a good idea to just load your book up with lots of turgid procedure and bureaucracy, but also you have to be able to um, convince your reader that, that, that the world that you're asking them to buy into is, is plausible. So having the right people doing the right things, getting things in the right order, having timelines broadly correct – you know, dialogue, all those sorts of things that go towards that, but but not not creating a textbook of policing because that's what nobody wants unless they want a textbook of policing, of course, and they go somewhere else. <laughs> so you had no idea then when you were uh, working as, as chief of police, you had no idea that you were going to go on and become a, a fiction writer then? Not, not the first clue, no. I mean, I've always, <laughs> I've always loved reading. I've, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm an absolutely... You know, vociferous reader, and and you know, always have been, and love crime, crime fiction. Um, but but it was yeah, this opportunity that Peter gave me, and he he he, he kind of nurtured my writing and coached me, and you know, sometimes gently, sometimes not so gently, but he coached me nonetheless. Uh, and uh, I found I obviously found something that was within all the time, but but I'd, I'd never surfaced until that point. Yeah. And I'm so delighted for the opportunity because it's a great great thing that I can do now. Mm. So tell us about your main character then. So Joe Howe, I, I always say that Joe Howe started off as a reluctant leader. She's a, um, she, she's a, the chief of police of Brighton and Hove, so she's doing the job that I used to do. Um, and, and she kind of landed it because, through, through a tragedy that um, is, is kind of exposed in, in, in Bad for Good. Um, she's, um, she, so she's, she's an ex-detective. She goes in. Uh, she's responsible for all of the policing in Brighton and Hove, uh, and and she's she's a mum. Um, she she's, she she lives with her, her husband Darren, who's a who's a journalist, and she's got two young boys. So she's battling the professional life and the personal life. And in a way, frankly, I don't think us men ever really did. You know, I was a very present father, but you know, but but you know, I don't think we had the inner inner sort of tensions that Joe has, which I've learned from. Um, former colleagues so she's she she kind of goes into this world and in bad for good she's battling with the the impact of um police cuts and and vigilantism's taken over the street uh, and she's also trying to um find the killer of her predecessor's son uh, and she she finds that actually all around her there's there's corruption narcissism um brutal people who who who, who will destroy her uh, you know at, at the blink, blink of an eye um, to, to get what they want. And she has to battle all this in a world that she didn't really opt to go into. She was kind of cajoled into it. Um, so she's, uh, you know, she, she, she suffers hugely from imposter syndrome. She, she, she's got great integrity. Um, she's a very, very skilled and, and, and able leader and police officer, even if she doesn't see it herself sometimes. Um, and, and she, she has no time for, but for, for corruption, she has no time for, for self-centered people, yet she's surrounded by them all the time. And in force of hate, she has to deal with a neo-Nazi council that's been dubiously elected to control Brighton and Hove, and they're trying to ethnically cleanse the city. And Brighton and Hove is a very diverse city um, with, with you know a, a, a great spirit to it. And they're trying to ethnically cleanse it using human trafficking victims, uh, euthanasia to fund a... Um, a, 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 a huge terrorist plot that they've got planned, and then the city on fire, which is the one that's out, um, it, oh, it was out March, March the the twenty first. She's she's got a battle with a big pharmaceutical company that are trying to destroy her and and all of those who who seem to be trying to suppress the drugs market market because they want a vibrant drugs market so that they can mark that they can push their their substitute drugs. Uh, on, on to, to, to the, the addicts of Brighton and Hope. So it's, they, they, there's quite a lot of brutality that they they bring into that. Mm. 
Mm. So why did you decide to make your protagonist female? I think um, initially, because I was a, you know, a, was a new debut, uh, a new um, fiction writer, I, I kind of tried to tried to predict where, 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 where the bear traps would be for me. And I think one of them, writing somebody in a, in a role that I've performed, in a place that I performed that role, the risk was making it too autobiographical, e- even if I didn't intend that, even if I made every effort to steer away from it. And I thought, you know, a, a, a simple way to, to, to avoid that, not the only way, but a simple way would be to make her a woman. And, and, and what I did in doing that is I, I kind of opened up a, a much richer character base for her than I would have done if I'd have, you know, done the, the straight white bloke, which is which is what I am. You know, to, to have somebody that has has really had to fight to get to where she is and, and fight to get the credibility of her peers and, and, the, and those above her and below her um, is something that I, you know, I mean, I obviously had to work hard to get promoted and get, get where I've been, but the pathway's designed for people like me. She was battling, you know, a, a, against a, a very, very strong tide in the opposite direction. And I learned a lot from ex-colleagues, you know, ex-women colleagues that, um, that, that went through that. So I think it created a much richer character and it stopped me writing myself, really. Yeah. Makes it more interesting, I guess, for both you and the reader, perhaps. I, I, I hope so. I mean, certainly it does for me. I hope it does for the reader too. Um, you know, the, the, there's lots of kind of inattention that I can, I can bring um, to, to Joe, uh, and and you know, I mean, it, it, you know, that question that you just asked me is one that I'm always asked, and uh, w- which shows that it is a, you know, it, it is something that interests people. But you know, Joe, Joe never feels that she's doing enough in whatever world she's in. If she's at home, she's always feeling that you know she's letting down her colleagues at work because she's at home looking after the kids, and while her husband's gone off on some journalistic ex- ex- expedition somewhere. Uh, and when she's at work, she should be, you know, she thinks she's a terrible mum because she should be home looking after her boys. And and that's real. I mean, this is what, you know, this is what former women officers have told me. Yeah, for sure. And uh, tell us a bit about your work on Annika. So I, I work with a number of, I work on a number of um, t- TV shows uh, and, and Annika is a pure joy. I, I was fortunate enough to come in um, on series two with, with, uh, with, with Annika because um I'd, I'd watched series one and I, and I knew the characters, I knew how Nicola Walker played the role. And it's for those that, you know, the, those that haven't seen it, it's a, it, 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 it's a unique, it's a unique drama. You know, there, there are, there, there, she, she, she breaks the fourth wall and she's talking to the camera quite a lot. It's, it's steeped in a lot of Scandinavian folklore, but it's, it, it's an incredibly action packed Scottish drama based on, a fictional unit that, that investigate marine homicides, and so I, I kind of worked on the scripts and uh, and, and on storylines, um, tr- trying to make sure that you know that that within how I knew Nicola Walker would play that part and how the other artists would, would play their part, that they that they you know um, amongst all of the other sort of uniqueness of of their roles that they that they were still authentic, and it, it's a really good example of that of me. Kind of using the, the the procedure and 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 the, the the real world to shore up rather than subsume the story because you know if you made Annika you know a, a real sort of accurate step by step procedural it, it would completely ruin the story completely ruin it mm-hmm. so you have to go with what the what the story is and what the what the writers are trying to achieve so I've done that with 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 with, with Annika I was we hunt together. Um, a, a drama that's just airing now on uh, Channel Five called um, called Coma. I, I worked on that as well, and, and a number of others too. Uh, and, and it's great. It's very different from working with, with authors, working with TV. Yeah, I have to say, Annika, I think is so good. I love the concept. Initially, I thought talking to camera—that's a bit weird. You know, you, you'd think that it just wouldn't work because it, as you say, it's really unique. But somehow it does. You feel like she's talking to you, like you're in with like a little joke that she's making. It's ever so clever. It really is. I mean, they, they, I think um, Nick, Nick Walker, who's the, um, who's the writer, really pulled off something special there. 
And you know, sometimes it's not just it's not only the talking, it's the kind of little looks that she gives to yes, camera as definitely. well. And it feels like you're in on the joke, doesn't totally. it? Totally. Yeah. Works really, really well. So have you decided or planned how many books you, you want there to be in this series, or is it just kind of one at a time? Yeah, well, one at a time at the moment. You know, I I I I'm I'm you know, I, I think Joe, you know, Joe has unfinished business. So, you know, hopefully they'll there'll be more. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly haven't got a shortage of um, carnage to put her through. You know, people often ask writers, "Where do you get your ideas from?" And I, well, I've got thirty years of ideas <laughs> from, uh, from 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 my policing, but it, it's about making them make, make making the challenges for Joe um, authentic and meaningful because it's it, it is a police procedural. These books are police procedurals, but they're they're politically influenced police procedurals. They've all got a political or or, or, or a social impetus that makes joe's world so challenging and um so challenging in fact that the trauma i put her through has meant that i've had to uh i've had to consult with psychologists to to get her story arc right because she can't come out of all of this carnage without a uh, without some impact and she's um so so you know i don't want to make any book a ptsd story but she needs to have kind of we need we need to see the scars of the, the, the hell I put her through. Yeah, oh, that's guilty. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's fun. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? What people come to you for authentication on police procedures, and and you're going to psychologists for authentication on that. So. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now I think we can all help each other. It's all mutual back scratching. Yeah, nice one. Well, if people want to get a copy of your latest book, City on Fire, it's available on our website, tre.radio, and it's by Graham Bartlett, who we've been chatting with today. Graham, thanks so much for joining us. Great to chat with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. This is TRE. You never know who might be listening to Daybreak. We're going to say good morning to Robert Bowman. He's the musical director for Chicago, usually in Broadway, but currently in Madrid. Morning, Robert. How are you? Why don't you join the morning revolution, bringing a dose of happiness to your morning routine? And I found you over the Google search and through my radio app. And I am not kidding. You have changed my experience for the last two months I've been here working on Chicago, hearing your show. Daybreak with Dave, Monday to Friday from 8 a.m. till 10 on TRE. It's fantastic. It's the perfect. I've been looking for this kind of show my whole life and I finally found it. Thank you. Brought to you by the leading real estate agent, Gilmar, who put their clients at the center of everything they do. TRE Talk Radio Europe. The TRE Book Show is sponsored by audible.co.uk. Download one title each month, plus unlimited listening to thousands of Audible originals, podcasts, and audiobooks. Just click on the Audible banner at www.tre.radio. The Book Program. Presented by Hannah Murray. Joining us on the line now is Susan Elkin, a former English teacher. She's been a professional author, journalist and critic for over 30 years. Books and reading have always been central to her life and work. She's with us on the book show to talk about her memoir on 70 years of reading. It's called All Booked Up. And she started writing a weekly books blog during lockdown. And uh, this basically ended up turning into a book. Welcome to the book show, Susan. Hello. Hi. Thank lovely you. Lovely to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you with us. So this, I mean, this isn't a new thing for you. You've written many books, haven't you? Um, yes. Uh, this is the third sort of memoir. Um, and I've written um, textbooks because I used to be an English teacher, um, how-to books for, te- for teachers, um, all sorts of things over the years. Yes. Wow. So uh, tell us uh, about this one. This This is quite a personal one, isn't it? It is personal, and it, it came about because I was thinking very hard about the books which had really influenced me most, and the books which had been turning points, pivots in my life. And in the end, I narrowed it down to 15, and based each chapter on one of those books. So the book's in 15 chapters, and it starts with Five Go Off in a Caravan, because that was the very first book I read independently, hmm. and ends up with Miss Benson's Beetle, which is one of the most, imp- by Rachel Joyce, which is one of the most impressive books I've read in recent years. Um, and the other 13 chapters deal with other aspects of my life and the books that influenced it. Yes, wonderful. Was it difficult narrowing it down to 15? <laughs> yes, <laughs> in a word. <laughs> <laughs> 
how did you, I mean, how did you go about it? Well, did you... I, I, in the end, I did it thematically. Um, music is a very big part of my life. Um, I'm an amateur player and have been since I was about five. So which book has influenced me most? And I decided that actually it was the Observer's Book of Music, which somebody gave me when I was a very small child. And from that, I built a chapter about music making and how you learn about music and how you develop. Mm. Um, similarly, I've been a vegetarian for well over 40 years. Well, how did that come about? Well, of course, it started with a book. <laughs> so it's all there in the chapter based on that book, which was yeah. called Taking the Rough with the Smooth by Dr. Andrew Stanway. And I think it was 1976. How interesting. Mm. And, and you really got, got the whole concept of vegetarianism from that book. Oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't as simple as that. Um, <laughs> no, life's not that simple. Um, I read the book, which was about what we now call fibre, which used then to be called roughage, because I had what med and have what medics um, rather delicately call a sluggish gut. So I read this book in the hope that it might help, and it did. But it led me to experimenting with the sorts of foods I'd never thought about before, like homeopasta and lentils, beans and things. And so I bought a vegetarian cookery book for ideas and it sort of gradually evolved mm. until the day that my husband and I realised that we actually no longer me needed meat because we were hardly eating any. Yeah. And then it became ethical. Yes. Interesting. Mm. And uh, you also have uh, b uh, books that uh, reflect on relationships, marriage, motherhood, things like that. All of that, yes, yes. Because... <laughs> I taught, for example, I, ta I taught my eldest son to read at home because we were in a place where I wasn't very happy with the schools and I wasn't at all sure that he would get the push that he needed when he started school. So I taught him at home. So it's very interesting how children learn to read. I mean, you see it when you're teaching them, but you see it in a totally different way when they're your own and at home. And I have two boys and their journey into reading, they both became readers eventually, but their journey into reading was completely different. Mm. So you can't generalise. No two children are the same. No, absolutely. And how much of the memory of Five Go Off in a Caravan is in the book? You remember how you oh, felt reading that book, do you? Yes, because I was... First of all, somebody read it to me. And that's on the very first page. A relation read it to me. And then... I picked it up and realised that I could actually read the words. I mean, obviously I'd been taught to read, but I was reading simpler stuff normally. And I suddenly realised I could read this and I could make sense of it. A very heady moment, you know. Mm. Um, my younger son remembers that happening to him. Most people don't quite have the memory of that clicking into place in the same way. It's just something that happens gradually and people aren't aware of it. Yeah. There's also some classics in the book. Rebecca, for example. Oh, gosh, Rebecca. Yes. Um, now, that's quite an interesting story. My mother had read Rebecca when it was first published. Presumably there were book reviews and things in newspapers in 1930, whatever it was. And she read it and loved it. So by the time I got to the age that she had been when she had read it, about 16, she said, oh, you must read this book. You'll love it, which I did. Hmm. I shared it with my friend and she loved it too. And then one day in school, an English teacher, by then I think we were probably in the lower six, an English teacher asked us what we were reading and we said we'd enjoyed Rebecca. And she said, you shouldn't be wasting your time with such rubbish. No. <laughs> wow. I mean, I knew even at the time... I knew she was wrong. Um, nothing that had given me such enormous pleasure could possibly be rubbish. It just didn't make sense. Mm. But what it taught me was that teachers should never, ever rubbish what their children or their students are reading. Yeah. And every English class I taught for 36 years, I always started off with a new class with that anecdote and said, so you can talk to me honestly, openly about what you're reading. I don't care what it is. We'll talk about it. And yeah. I shall never, ever criticise you for it. And I didn't. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's so important to get children excited about reading. So it, whether they're reading car manuals or, you know, books about horses or whatever it might be, whatever yes. they're interested in that gets them into reading is crucial. Yeah. When I became a school librarian, fairly early on in my teaching career, actually, I was given responsibility for the library. I was teaching all boys. 
And I very quickly discovered that what we needed was several copies of the Angling Times <laughs> because that was what they really loved to read. They wanted to read about fishing, which seemed very strange to me. <laughs> but that was the culture there. So, yeah. of course, I did it. I made sure the Angling Times was in the library and I needed several copies because I kept nicking it. <laughs> it's very important to tap into children's interests. Yes, for and, I mean, sure. some children never take to fiction. That's fine. Find biography. Find things that will actually turn them on. Mm. But I, I wrote a book once called Encouraging Reading, which is now published by Bloomsbury. And in it, I argue passionately and I really believe that teaching children to read is not about decoding squiggles and phonics. That's the easy bit. Almost everybody can learn to do that. It's a sort of mechanical thing. Yeah. The real time when you learn to read is after that, when you get to the five go off in a caravan stage and you start reading independently. And and you sort of it's like jumping into the deep end if you were swimming. Mm. And that's what has to be encouraged because a lot of children learn to decode so teachers think, Oh good, they can read now and we'll move on to something else. But yeah. actually that's the that's the point at which you need to start, not stop. Mm. So tell us a bit about your blog, Susan's Bookshelves. One of my daughters-in-law was one of the many people that phoned me regularly during lockdown to make sure I hadn't died of grief because I hadn't been widowed very long oh. and boredom and or, or loneliness. Mm. And I hated lockdown. I was awful. And in the end, she said, well, look, you read all these books. Why don't you write about them? Because my work had all dried up, of course, in lockdown. Why don't you write about the books that you're reading? I thought, hey, that's a good idea. So I started Susan's Bookshelves, and that is now uh, well over three years ago. And I've done it every week ever since. And it's there for any reader that wants to read it. It goes up every week. Um, This week's coming up is a book of short stories by a local girl who asked me if I'd read her book. And yes, fine. So that's sort of a bit wacky, really. The week after... Um, is Dombey and Son, which I'm just in the process of rereading. Last week was Charlotte's Web, which is a classic children's book. Mm. So I try to keep it as eclectic as I possibly can. Some new books, you know, that I've read reviews of and just read now. Um, quite a lot of rereading of books I'm coming back to. And just books that come my way, like this book of short stories. Nice. And how do you feel generally when you reread a book? Presumably it's a book that you remember enjoying. What's it like the second time round? Usually even better, Hmm. but not necessarily. I tried recently to reread A.S. Byatt's Possession, which I thought was absolutely marvellous when I first read it. it. You may remember it won the Booker Prize. Yeah. And... I read it earlier that year and thought, my goodness, if this doesn't win the booker, what will? And it did. So then I read it again later that year and I still loved it. And it sat on my shelves ever since. When I tried to reread it recently, I got bored with it. Wow, isn't that interesting? I was very surprised. Were you able to work out why? What was no, it? not really. No. <laughs> Just I think perhaps AF by is now a bit dated. I, I don't know. Yeah. But... You have other experiences with rereading books. Now, this is an anecdote I used to tell my students. I was about in my early 20s when I first tried to read The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Mm-hmm. Now, I read it, but I found it really quite hard going. About a few years later, I came back to it and reread it, and I just found it an absolute page turner. Hmm. I read it very quickly and thought it was just wonderful, and I've read it several times again since. Now, as I used to say to the students, it's not the book that's changed. It's me. Yeah. You know, I've matured enough now to be able to take that. Whereas when I tried to read it in my early 20s, I couldn't. Yeah. And I used to tell them, you know, that there are some books that they could read if they wanted to, but they might not be ready. And maybe it might be better to leave it for a bit. You know, this was the sort of thing I would just discuss Mm. with them. Yes, it makes sense, doesn't it? That we change, our tastes change, what we're interested in, um, our knowledge, of course, expands, yeah. hopefully, so that can yeah. make a difference as well. And the sort of level of comprehension, I think, too. Mm. Um, I'm not sure when I first read The Grapes of Wrath that I really understood the point of it. Yeah. But by the time I read it the second time, I did. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. And uh, is there a, a book that kind of stands out that you know that you've read more than any, that you've read over and over oh, again? Oh, more than any. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. 
Because, I mean, you just said that you'd read that three or four times, which I oh, find yes. amazing. Oh, yes, <laughs> goodness <laughs> me. I've probably read Jane Eyre half a dozen times. Gosh. Um, I recently reread Mansfield Park and wrote about it on the blog. Um, <laughs> it must have been at least the third or fourth time. Wow. Um, a book that stands out. How about Town Like Alice by Neville Shute? Okay. Now, I read that as a teenager because my mother liked it. Something very special about books between mothers and daughters. Um, and I loved it, absolutely loved it, and I cried. Years and years later, I think I've probably only read it twice, years and years later, when I was teaching, I read it because I think I'd mentioned it to the students how much I'd enjoyed it when I was their age. So I reread it, and I cried. And when I cried... I thought, my God, this is the same place I cried in as a teenager. <laughs> now, that is really quite some book. If it makes you cry 15 on the same page, and the same thing happens again when you're 55 or whatever I was. Yes. You know. And what's that called? A Town Like Alice okay, by yes. Neville Shute. Wow. Quite a classic in its day, actually. Yes. Interesting. I don't think people read Neville Shute much now. No, I, I haven't. That sort of rings a bell, but I haven't read it. I'll look it up. Yes. Oh, I think you'd enjoy it. <laughs> yes. I'll see if I cry. I'll let you know. I probably will. <laughs> yeah. And um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about Miss Benson's Beetle. I know you mentioned it's one of the more recent books you've read and, and really enjoyed. What yeah. Did you like it so much? I liked it because it's a celebration of the most unlikely female friendship. It's about... A very, a rather unsuccessful school teacher. She's old, she's frumpy, she's struggled with dealing with teenage girls and she's very miserable. And then she inherits some money and decides that she'll go off to the other side of the world in search of some beetle that she'd seen in a book when she was a child, some rare beetle. But she needs a companion. So she, she advertises for one. And the one she gets is a young woman who is absolutely 100% unsuitable. <laughs> But over what happens to them on this quest, because it is a quest story really for the Beatle, they discover a level of friendship and mutual support that is unimaginable on page one. And I thought it was just brilliant. Mm. Loved it. Oh, nice. Well, it's been lovely chatting with you. Some some great book recommendations we've got, uh, uh, particularly yours, all booked up, it's called. If listeners want to get a copy of that, it's available now on our website, tre.radio, and it's by Susan Elkin, who we've been chatting with today. Susan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Hannah. The Book Programme, presented by Hannah Murray. Joining us on the line now is Rosie Hewlett, having secured a first class honours degree in classical literature and civilization at the University of Birmingham. She has studied Greek mythology in depth and is passionate about unearthing strong female voices within the classical world. Her self-published debut novel Medusa won the Rubery Book of the Year Award in 2021. She's with us on the book show to talk about her latest novel, Medea. It's a visceral Greek myth retelling that places Medea, who was previously understood only through the lens of Jason's story, very much at the centre of the narrative. Welcome to the book show, Rosie. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. So do you remember where your love of Greek mythology came from? I have to credit it really to my sister because um, we were lucky enough that we went to a secondary school that offered classics as a subject. And when I was choosing my GCSE subjects, my older sister just said to me, you need to study classics because you will love it. <laughs> and I think she she just knew that it would be a subject for me because of just all of the creativity and the craziness. And it's just such a fun subject. And so I followed her advice and I chose it for GCSE and I just completely fell in love with it immediately and haven't looked back since really. Yeah, lovely. So tell us about the uh, the main character in your novel. Medea, yes. So she's 
a very famous character in the ancient world. She's known as being a witch and she's known as being a bit of a villain. Um, she makes some bad decisions in her life that takes her down some very dark paths and she ends up doing some very dark things. I won't give any spoilers, but um, she's remembered as being a villain. So I really wanted to write this story to explain her whole character arc or downward spiral and to sort of explain how she gets to that point and let readers decide if she really is the villain or if it's the other people in her life that pushed her towards that end that she sadly gets to. So, yeah. And she was very much kind of shunned by her mother and and separated from her family, really. Yes. Well, that's something that I wanted to explore in my book because the thing about Medea is she betrays her whole family um, for the man that she falls in love with. And um, But I didn't want it just to be motivated by the romance in the plot. I wanted to give Medea more agency. So in my book, I really explore her relationship with her family and looking at the idea of why would this girl betray her parents, betray her siblings, betray her homeland? And what was that motivated by? And that led me down the path of yeah, really exploring those family relationships, Medea's role as being the shunned other because of her witchcraft and her magic and that opened up the character for me uh, when writing her which was was really uh, enjoyable experience mm. and what was her connection to Jason so Jason, he arrives in Medea's homeland of Colchis and he's in search of the Golden Fleece, which her father possesses. And Medea falls in love with Jason because he's a very dashing, very charming hero. And um, and she likes the look of him. But then also in my book, she sees an opportunity with Jason to escape her home that she doesn't like. Um, so they team up to try and get the Golden Fleece and it sets in motion this big epic adventure which also leads to the darker path that Medea ultimately goes down. And you're looking at this story through kind of a modern lens, aren't you? And and themes that we hear and, and talk about today, things like gaslighting, mental health awareness, that kind of thing. Yes, exactly. I mean, all those elements are in the ancient texts, but it's it's pulling those those pieces out. And I think every time a Greek myth is retold, because they've been retold for thousands and thousands of years, each reteller focuses on elements that suit their audience. So for me, I've really focused on those gaslighting elements, the mental health element of Medea, um, just the relationship with her family, all of those elements that I feel like readers today can really connect with, even though this is a fantastical epic story from the ancient world. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those themes then. Where does gaslighting come into it? So gaslighting comes in with um, Medea's relationship with Jason. Um, I say it starts off as a love story, but it really is sort of in quotation marks a love story. Um, I think quite quickly readers will see that it's a little bit questionable what Jason's real motives are. Um, And he is, well, I like to call him King Gaslighter because even in the ancient texts, (laughs) he's, he's very much... He's, a, he's very good at manipulating those around him. And Medea, who is, you know, quite a young, naive girl who doesn't know much of the world, she is incredibly powerful, but she's also incredibly naive. So she falls victim to that. And that's that's what kind of sets her story in motion. So the themes of, of toxic masculinity, that's also connected to Jason then? Yeah, I think toxic masculinity, it's so prevalent in the ancient world, being a patriarchal society where men had to be big, heroic, you know, saviors. I think that is inherent in all of the male characters in this book. You can see it in Medea's father. You can see it in her brother and Jason. I think they're all trying to aspire to this unrealistic expectation of being the best and being the hero as they were expected to be in the ancient world. And that is ultimately detrimental to all of them because, you know, they end up doing horrible things or or just turning into horrible people because they're really trying to become something that is an unrealistic aim. Um, So it's a really interesting thing to explore in in the myth. Yeah. How about gender politics then? Well, gender politics, I suppose it it comes into it a lot because I something I really wanted to do is explore the women in Medea's myth. In the ancient world, I think there's a real lack of female relationships. It's very much explores women in relation to men rather than women in relation to other women. So something I was really passionate about is is bringing forward those really interesting women in Medea's myth who are characters like Circe and Atalanta um, and exploring those relationships. And through those characters, there's a lot of discussion about women's roles in society, um, which a lot of that is still, you know, connected to today, even though it's 
thousands of years old, this myth, we can still find a lot of connections to the way women were treated. Um, and it was a really important thing for me to bring out those those gender roles and politics in the story. Mm. And mental health, of course, if you look at it through that, it allows you to, to explore these myths in, and, and see it in a, a completely new way. Yes, exactly. And so much of the ancient myths, they do, they explore the the mental health side, definitely, but they, they just don't have words or names for things that the characters are going through. But the, the ancient writers um, were, you know, really good at ex- exploring these characters and what was going on in their heads. I mean, in the Argonautica, we see Medea struggling in her mind, and it's, it's a really beautiful description of her, not sure if she should betray her family or help Jason. So they did explore, you know, the emotion mental side of it but I think they just didn't have that kind of in that world they didn't have the understanding that we do now about mental health so I think we can explore it a little bit more of a freer way um, and a more of an understanding way so it's it's really it's it's building on what was already there because these ancient myths are incredible and they've survived for so long for a reason and it's just exploring them and and adding to them and, and adding our own spin and looking at them through our own lens yeah and why do you think these myths are are what i said i was going to say popular now but they've always been popular haven't they and and the retelling of these myths why do you think that still happens today I think that, I mean, firstly, these are just amazing stories. I think they're incredibly captivating in them in their own, you know, right. But then also, I think that the nature of myth to be a retelling and to be retold, I think that allows them to have like continual life because they can mold and adapt to every new audience, to every new voice that tells them. So like I said earlier, as people adapt the stories to, to suit their readers or listeners, that allows these stories to just keep staying relevant and keep staying interesting. Though you're keeping the core of the story the same, you are adapting it. So they just they keep having new life breathed into them. So they've survived for thousands of years and I think they will continue to survive for thousands of years. Yeah. And have you got lots of other ideas for for characters and books that you want to write? Yes, I mean, there's there's a huge wealth of amazing characters in the ancient world. Um, and I'm currently writing book three, which I've not announced yet, but that is in the same vein. And yeah, there's just I mean, there's a lot to pull from. It's it's such a incredible period of history with so many incredible stories. So it kind of, yeah, it's spoiled for choice, really. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So when you wrote the first book, Medusa, did you find a, a format and a way of writing that really worked for you that you've been able to implement in the writing of this next book? Or did you, uh, I don't know, realise that there were maybe better ways of doing it and have kind of changed change your course a bit? I definitely think I, I have learned to plan a bit more. <laughs> when I wrote Medusa, it was really just um, Medusa's voice was so in my head that I just I had to sit down and just write. I didn't plan it really at all. It was just a almost like a stream of consciousness, which the book is. It doesn't have chapters. It's more like a collection of Medusa's memories. It's how I've written it. So it does read in that way. Um, and I just had to sit down and get it out. And then like I was with Medea, Again, her voice was so clear in my head. I I did do a bit more planning for Medea because her myth is a lot bigger and there's a lot more elements to it, and it's a much bigger book. But um, but again, I, I kind of just sat down and just started writing. And I think you have a bit of a freedom to do that when you're doing a myth retelling because the story's there already. It's not like you're creating your own story or your own world. We've got to really meticulously plan it out. You've got that skeleton arc that's already there to play with, so it allows you to be a bit more, I suppose less organized <laughs> but it's something I'm trying to be a bit more organized on just to help myself so the first draft isn't completely chaotic yeah yeah you have to find a way that works for you don't you yes exactly <laughs> well if people want to get a copy of Medea it's out now it's available on our website tre.radio and it's by Rosie Hewlett who we've been chatting with today Rosie thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me it's been great the book program Presented by Hannah Murray. Talk Radio Europe. Your voice in Spain. The Book Program. Presented by Hannah Murray. Welcome to the second part of tonight's book show. 
In the first hour, we were chatting with Graham Bartlett, Susan Elkin and Rosie Hewlett. In this hour, we chat to Ellie Griffiths. She's an acclaimed crime author who worked in publishing before becoming a full-time writer. She's best known for her award-winning Dr. Ruth Galloway series. She wrote her first standalone, The Stranger Diaries, in 2018, which was a bestseller and selected for a Richard and Judy summer read, as well as for the BBC Radio 2 book club. She's with us on the book show to talk about her fourth standalone, The Last Word. We also chat to CJ Barker, who boasts a rich history as an educator in schools and universities in the UK and Australia. His multi-generational family saga is set against a backdrop of the Second World War and the late 1960s, reflecting on the scars left by war. It was inspired by his parents' experience of World War II, especially the fact that his father was a soldier during the D-Day landings and the subsequent impact of PTSD on the family family. The book is called Hungry Ghosts. We're also chatting to Nick McLaughlin, who grew up in Derby, where his debut novel Slings and Arrows is set. It follows the life of 45-year-old Terry, who finds unlikely success with his local amateur darts team. It's a funny novel focusing on the lives of an ordinary group of people in the East Midlands. And finally, on tonight's book show is Ashley Wright. He's a novelist and author who holds a first-class honours degree and a master's in history. A lover of sci-fi and fantasy with a lifelong affinity for the past, he begins his literary journey with an action-packed debut novel, Hella's Angels. It's a historical fantasy young adult novel following a young boy who finds himself drawn into a battle against monsters in the midst of the Second World War. And that's tonight's book show on Talk Radio Europe. The Book Programme. Presented by Hannah Murray. Joining us on the line now is acclaimed crime author Ellie Griffiths, who worked in publishing before becoming a full-time writer. She's best known for her award-winning Dr. Ruth Galloway series and the Brighton Mystery series. In 2018, she wrote her first standalone novel, The Stranger Diaries. It was a top 10 paperback bestseller, selected for the BBC Radio 2 Book Club, a summer 2019 Richard and Judy book, and it won the Edgar Award for Best Novel in the USA. In 2019, Ellie published her first children's book, A Girl Called Justice. She's back with us on the book show to talk about her latest novel, The Last Word. It's her fourth standalone novel. Welcome to the book show, Ellie. Hi, it's lovely to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you back with us. And um, gosh, do you do you get confused as to which book you're talking about when? <laughs> Sometimes slightly, only just because, as you know, you're talking about a book that you've already written and your head's in the book that you're writing at the moment. And my last two books have been called The Last Remains and The Last Word, which has confused me occasionally, I have to say. <laughs> oh, lovely, though, to be doing so many different things. Why did you decide to write a children's book? Well, I've always wanted to write a children's book. I used to work in children's publishing and I just, well, I love reading children's books still, I have to say. And I had an idea about writing about my mom, who was at boarding school in the 1930s and always thought that she should be a detective and solve crimes. <laughs> so I thought of a character based on my mom and that was Justice Jones. So there are four books at, about Justice Jones, who's a, at boarding school in the 1930s. And she was luckier than my mom because my mom always wanted one of the teachers to be murdered and it never happened. <laughs> happened but it does happen to justice so those are the justice books oh fabulous and um i know you brought your award-winning ruth galloway mystery series to a close after 15 years i bet that was strange it really was. So, yeah, 15 books in 15 years. And I haven't been brave enough uh, to say it's the end forever. I've only said it's the end for now. But, you know, there, there are a series about a forensic archaeologist called Dr. Ruth Galloway who gets uh, involved in, in solving crimes. And also she does get involved with the DCI, Harry Nelson. So you've got, as well as the mysteries, and each one is a self-contained mystery, you've got this kind of will-they-won't-they. They. And I did think that if you do have a will-they-won't-they they romance 
there has to be a time when you say whether they do or whether they don't. So without giving any spoilers away, in book 15, you do find that out. So mm. there might be more, but for now, uh, Ruth and Nelson are having a bit of privacy. <laughs> good for them and good for you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so is it totally different when you're writing a, a standalone book? Do you write the book differently because you know that there's not going to be a, a follow on after it? Well, the thing is, I have to say, I'm not very good at standalone. So although this is called a standalone, and it is, you can read it on its own, you don't have to read anything else, it does contain characters who I've invented before. So it it has the characters from the postscript murders. So there's Edwin, who's um, a retired uh, BBC uh, uh, radio presenter. There's Natalka, a Ukrainian carer, and Benedict, an ex-monk who now runs a coffee shop. So we have met those people before. Um, So in some ways, it's a standalone. In some ways, it's a continuation. But when I did write a standalone, Stranger Diaries was my first standalone book. It's a strange thing because in some ways it's easier than a a series because you could just make it all up and you don't have painted yourself into that corner um, that that you've done deliberately of giving your your character's whole backstory that you can't change. But in another way, um, it's more difficult because there is that sort of empty page and anything can happen. Whereas with characters, I've I've been with Ruth and Nelson for 15 books, so I kind of know how they think and how they talk. So I would say it's both more difficult and easier in a way to write a standalone. (laughs) So why did you bring some of those characters that you mentioned into this new book? Well, it's funny because there are some characters that you write who who you like and who work perfectly well for the book, but you just know you're not going to use them again. And there are some other characters that just kind of clamour to be heard again. And weirdly, um, Edwin, who I have to say on paper is nothing like me because he's, he's, he's an 86-year-old gay man living in um, Shoreham by Sea, uh, ex-BBC uh, producer. He was a voice I just wanted to be with again. I just wanted to tell a story from his point of view again. So. Um, um, I'd, I'd also had this idea for a while about obituaries. You know, when you read an obituary, uh, see a description of, of a dead person's life, sometimes at the end of it, there's just a single line that says um, that the obituary writer predeceased the, the subject of the obituary. And I thought, oh, that's, that's quite strange, isn't it? So at the beginning of this book, Edwin sees a pattern of obituary writers dying. So that really led me into the book. And having had that idea, I thought, well, Edwin and Natalka and Benedict were the right people to tell it. Yeah. And is that where the phrase, the last word comes in? That ties in quite nicely. Definitely. Yes. As I say, the book before, which was Ruth 15, was The Last Remain. So my publishers and I agonise a little bit about it sounding so similar. But if you're writing about an obituary writer dying, you almost do have to call your book The Last Word. (laughs) So, uh, yes. So that's the title of the book. And it also leads to uh, the characters in the book go to a very sinister writer's retreat, which I loved writing about, and an even more sinister book group. So really, it is a book about books, which I loved writing. Oh, nice. And have you have you done many writers retreats? Can you talk about that from experience? Well, as you know, I've never been on one as a writer, but I have taught uh, on, a, on a couple of creative writing courses myself. And I should just say here that none of the characters in my book resemble <laughs> any of my students in any way. But I do rather like the idea of a retreat, you know, the, the whole sense of, of going away from the outside world and in this case, it's it's a house called Battle House near Hastings. It's in the middle of a wood. You're sort of away from society. It is a bit of a closed circle or a locked room murder mystery. And you're you're talking all the time about writing and books. It's a really interesting environment, I have to say. So um, when I've been on retreats, I, I in fact went on a, a, a religious retreat not far from there when I was at school, was at a Catholic school. So I have been on retreats, but I've never been on a creative writing retreat. Though, as I say, I teach creative writing and I have used some of the uh, exercises that I do use for my with my students in this book. It's a great setting, a retreat, I think, because people, as you say, they're, they're away, often in the middle of nowhere, they're away from home, they're all very relaxed. It's a, yeah, it seems like a, a great setting for things to go wrong. <laughs> well, exactly. And it's funny how intense it becomes very quickly, doesn't it? When, you, when you're, uh, as you say, away from your everyday life and with these people you didn't know before, but suddenly you, you form quite intense relationships with them. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens in this this book and and you also get the the um uh, the situation which happens again in this book where Benedict, who loves writing, just can't think of anything to say on this course. He can't think of anything to write. Whereas Edwin um, is, is the teacher's pet. So I quite <laughs> enjoyed exploring, you know, th- those relationships within the group. 
Yeah, the different kinds of people that you're likely to find on a, on a writer's retreat as well. Yes, and I think that's the wonderful thing about writing generally, isn't it? There are all sorts of different people. And on this retreat, you've got you've got a crime writer, you've got a children's book writer, you've got somebody who keeps telling everyone that he was long listed for the booker. So you've just got very different sorts of writing. So I have to say, I really did enjoy that. Yeah. And do you feel a, a bit of pressure when you write a new book and you uh, kind of put it out into the world when you've had so much success in the past with awards and things, do you kind of think, oh, I hope this one's going to be okay, or do you try not to think about it? Oh, it's so strange, isn't it? But I was listening to your lovely interview with Jilly Cooper, and she said, oh, darling, I wish it did get easier, <laughs> because it, it doesn't really get easier. Um, you wish it would. You know, you you think, um, the last word's actually my 30th book, my 30th published book, which I had to add that up a couple of times. I wasn't sure it could be true. So you'd think it, you'd just be able to sit at your computer and a book would come out. But each one is different, which is fun. I think that's one of the things that, that keeps it being fun. Each one is different and each one has its own um, problems and own, own plot issues that you have to solve. So I think that's what keeps it exciting. But I think writing is one of those things that just doesn't get easier as you go along yeah and as you say maybe there's a tiny bit of expectation now that that at least now I know people are waiting to read the book whereas when I started of course when I was unpublished I could write anything I liked I I didn't think anyone was going to read it but now (laughs) I I do hope people are out there who want to read it so that does put a little bit of pressure on the writer I think yeah and have you found a, a way of writing that you've been doing for a number of years that you that you know kind of works It's funny because it has slightly changed for me. So uh, I am one of those thousand words a day writers. So I'm talking to you from my little writing shed in the back garden. (laughs) And uh, from there with my cat, Pip, who always sits with me, I try and do at least a thousand words a day. So so that's sort of my um, process. But when I first started writing, really for, for like my first sort of 15 books, I guess, I was writing a chapter plan. So I would plan it all the way to the end and I would know who did it. I would know who died because they're crime fiction. Obviously, people die. Um, So uh, I'd know who died and who did it. But when I wrote The Stranger Diaries, actually, which, as I was saying, was was my first standalone, though it didn't remain a standalone, um, I just didn't write anything down. So I had it all in my head, but I felt like I could go, I could be a bit freer. I could go and wander off little pathways, little cul-de-sacs and come back to the main story. Um, And I read a brilliant description of that by the American writer E.L. Dottereau. And he said, writing like that was like driving in the dark with your headlights on. You can only (laughs) see a bit of the road, but you can make the whole journey like that. So that was a real light bulb or a, you know, headlight moment for me. And so from that moment on, I haven't written anything down. So I haven't ever had a written plan for my books. I just kind of trust that they do evolve. And I think that makes them harder to solve for the reader because I'm a little unsure about who the, who the culprit is. So hopefully that makes it harder to spot for the reader. That's the idea anyhow. And, and I imagine that's more fun for you as a writer as well, doing less planning. And then when you're writing, you can probably be a bit surprised as, as you're going along and, and shocked and things. So you're getting the emotion in the same way as the reader might be. Yes, exactly. You, you, there's a knock on the door and I don't know who's there. And it really, as you say, yes, it definitely keeps it more exciting for me and it's fun. Um, and you just don't know what's going to happen next. So uh, obviously when you've, you've finished the, uh, the draft, you do then have to go back and make sure it all makes sense. Um, <laughs> but yes, I think that's definitely true. It does make it more exciting. And is the editing process a bit kind of laborious? Do it, some authors really enjoy it and some authors kind of loathe it? <laughs> How do you feel about it? I, I do I do really like it. I used to be an editor, as you said at the beginning, I used to work in publishing and that's what I did. Having said that, you'd think I would be a lot better at editing my own stuff, but I'm <laughs> definitely do things like, I don't know, uh somebody get into a, a cab wearing a skirt and get out wearing trousers, you know, um, <laughs> forget what day it is and all those things that, that you need an editor for. But I've been really lucky, actually, because I've had the same editor for all my books, all, all my books written as Ellie Griffiths, and she's called Jane Wood, and she's brilliant. So I really love that process. I'm not a writer who shows their work to many people, probably thinking of uh, uh, writer's retreats like the one in my book. Um, so I don't show it to lots of people. So Jane's always the first person to see it. 
And I wait for her feedback because, of course, you know, I want, want to know if it's any good or not. But then I really love that process with Jane of working on the book and making it better. And we know each other so well now. And uh, she knows the characters in the series book. So actually that bit is really fun because you have the manuscript there and you can work on it. So it's not the moment when you do think halfway through writing it, am I ever going to get a manuscript? Is it ever going to, you know, writing a thousand words a day, is it ever going to end? But when it has finished and you have the manuscript and you're working on it with, with your editor, I really enjoy that. Nice, nice. It's nice that you enjoy it, isn't it? It's, it's lovely that it all doesn't feel like a a slog and a job. It's something that you really enjoy as well as it being a job, which is perfect. It is lovely. I do feel very lucky, I think, to, to be able to, you know, make a living doing what I love doing because I'd be writing anyhow. I, I'd be writing any. I wrote many books that weren't published. I wrote my first crime novel when I was 11. It was, <laughs> it was called The Hair of the Dog, which must have been something my parents talked about a lot. Um, <laughs> but it was a sort of Agatha Christie-esque crime novel with set in little village where I live. So I've always written. So the thought that I can now do it as a job is, is kind of wonderful, really. Lovely. Well, if listeners want to get a copy of your latest book, it's called The Last Word. It's available on our website, tre.radio, and it's by Ellie Griffiths, who we've been chatting with today. Ellie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Hello, little Alan Bennett here. If I'm not writing books, then... The thing I like most is listening to the book club on Talk Radio Europe. Fancy. Joining us on the line now is Chris Barker. He boasts a rich history as an educator in schools and universities in the UK and Australia. He's with us on the book show to talk about his latest novel. It's a multi-generational family saga set against the backdrop of the Second World War and the late 60s, reflecting on the scars left by war. Inspired by Chris's parents' experience of World War II, especially the fact that his dad was a soldier during the D-Day landings and the subsequent impact of PTSD on the family. The book is called Hungry Ghosts. Welcome to the book show, Chris. Oh, thank you, Hannah. It's lovely to be here. Nice to have the opportunity to talk to you about the book. Yes, it's great to have you with us. So tell me a little bit about your background then and and why you came to write this book. It's obviously a very uh, personal story, this one. Yes, I mean, uh, the book was uh, inspired, I suppose you might use that word, by my family, uh, my experiences of my family, or I should say more accurately, my reflections as an adult on my family. I don't think these were things that I really understood as a child or as a young person. But my tra- my family was slightly troubled, I think you might say. My father was... Uh, had a bit of a drink problem. Uh, he was an alcoholic, basically, um, and that had its disturbing impact on the family. Um, I found him quite difficult. As a young man, I was quite rebellious. I mean, we're talking about the late 60s when I was a teenager, and, you know, I embraced a lot of the hippie values and politics of... Uh, the left of the time, I think of the kind of act of rebellion. My father wasn't very impressed with that, and we clashed quite a lot. So at the time, I didn't have much um, time for him. But as I grew older and I began to understand a little bit more about the circumstances that had brought him to be that way, he never spoke about it. He never spoke about his experiences in the Second World War, at least to me. All I knew about that came later from my mother. So most of what I learned about my father's wartime experiences came from my Mm mum when I asked her later uh, about that. So the book really is a kind of, it was kind of like taking my experience of my family and putting it into a prism and having a fictional story come out the other side. I mean, the characters are not my family. I mean, the central male protagonist is Vic. He was a, he's an RAF bomber. My father was in the army. My mother never worked for the government in the way that Ruth's character does. So it's a novel. It's fiction. Yeah. But it's fiction 
born out of my own experience, I suppose, and my reflections on that. So what did your mother tell you about your father's involvement in the war? I know that he was stationed in Africa for a good part of the war. I saw photographs of that, um, which she showed me. Well, basically, I suppose the most important thing uh, that she talked to me about was the fact that he had been a participant in the D-Day landings, that he had seen his friends killed, uh, his best friend in particular, that he would wake in the night, having had nightmares about that experience and would shout out the name of his friend, uh, friend, one friend in particular. That was basically what my mother explained to me. Basically, she was trying to give me an explanation for what I regarded as his um, difficult behaviour. Yeah. And uh, explain that to me. You can you can kind of see, can't you? I mean, you, we we can't even imagine what that must have been like for so many men to have experienced those D Day landings and seeing, as you say, their their friends and and comrades all around them being killed in such a way. You, you totally get that that would affect people for the rest of their lives. Absolutely, I spent quite a lot of time trying to understand that, um, both in terms of the psychology of it. I mean, I think nowadays we understand uh, a good deal more about the nature of post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. Uh, as we Now, at the time, they called it combat stress, I think, and they didn't really understand it or have much time for it. My father certainly didn't get any help. It was really post-Vietnam War that um, psychologists begin to take that a bit more seriously. So he certainly didn't get that help. But, yes, I think that we understand that now. And and I watched a lot of uh, news footage and film and books and tried to use my imagination, really, to imagine what some aspects of, of that might have been. And it was a therapeutic experience for me yeah. to try and understand my father. And I think I described somewhere this book as a kind of act of forgiveness in a way, a forgiveness and an understanding towards mm-hmm. my father. I think now I didn't understand him. I don't think he understood me, but I didn't understand him and his experiences and why he was the way that I was. And as I came to understand that, so I felt able to put my own anger with him to one side and forgive him. And that did me a lot of good too. I think when you learn to forgive someone who you feel has treated you badly, you learn to live better yourself. You can, you understand things more. You can let it go. I think yeah. that's it. You can yeah, it's it powerful. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's it's interesting. Not only people affected from with the war and with all these experiences that so many of them didn't talk about it. You know, they didn't want to talk about it. They couldn't talk about it. And again, now we not only understand the the effects of of PTSD and and what that means, but also people are encouraged to talk about things all the time. You know, if you have anything going on inside, it's really important to talk about it. So it was kind of like a a double whammy. They weren't understood what they or, or, or cared about for what they might be going through and they weren't encouraged to talk about it. So it was a lot for them to deal with and, and process. Absolutely. I mean, I think that nowadays there's a, an inducement or an incitement, one might say, to talk. In fact, it's the thing, isn't it? I think, you know, mm-hmm. psychology has become a dominant force in our culture. It almost requires us to talk about our, our problems, and mainly mainly for good reasons, Mm -hmm. Um, not always, but mainly. I think it's a useful thing to do. Um, I did a lot of it myself, talking to psychologists, but I think that's true. But men of that generation didn't really do that, and I think it's a generational thing. It wasn't really understood and encouraged at that time, but I also think it's a gender thing. I think men in particular are discouraged from talking about that. I mean, I think it's interesting and probably pertinent that um, what I came to understand about what happened came from my mother. She was more able to talk about that than my father ever was, who locked it locked it away mm. and became a very uh, not talkative, 
not demonstrative kind of a man who took his refuge in a bottle. Yeah. I, I also say, though, because I'm making a point about gender, so I'd like to say as well, really, that my mother had a hard time too. I mean, my mother was um, engaged to be married to an RAF flyer who was shot down and killed over Germany. So she had her own um, problems there. And she also wanted to get an education. There's a character in my book, Ruth, who... Um, wants an education. She desperately wants to carry on at school and carry on and learn and maybe one day dream the uh, unimaginable and go to university and she's not allowed to. That was inspired in me by my mum. I mean, my mum was a telephonist during the war, actually, which is a protected occupation. And she really wanted to have been able to carry on at school and carry on with her education, and she basically wasn't allowed to by, ironically, her own mother, who thought that wasn't a thing for girls to do. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? And th- th- you talk about it in the book, and intergenerational trauma and how um, a lot of things are, are passed on and, and travelled down through families. Absolutely. Look, I mean... Uh, a bit like um, post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't think that um, back in uh, my parents' day that was understood. I think now we can understand that intergenerational trauma is a real thing. I certainly believe that it is so, that it's carried down generations by a number of things culturally. Uh, we are taught as children various aspects of how to look upon the world by our parents, but also actually genetically. There's some interesting scientific evidence that, well, it's epigenetic, actually. So you have genes and around the genes, you have chemicals that um, organize how those genes are expressed. And there's some evidence that that uh, surrounding material is altered by trauma. So there's some evidence that men who were involved in traumatic situations, sperm was altered by that trauma and it alters the function and the way that certain genes are enacted. So in in brief, there's both cultural and genetic and psychological evidence to suggest that trauma is uh, passed on generationally. Mm -hmm. And I feel that for myself. So I feel that it's taken me quite a long time to come to terms with my family, with my father in particular. I was just an unbelievably angry and rebellious young man and uh, I had very little time for him. And it took me a while to come to terms with that. I had my own struggles, my psychological struggles. I had my own periods of being depressed, uh, which thankfully is well behind me now. But I definitely see that as being uh, like an ongoing function of that i see some facets of myself and i generalize that out to certain kinds of even some of the late 60s political rebellious youth movements as owing something to a reaction to the trauma of their parents Mm. so that's partly also why i wrote the book i'm kind of trying to come to terms with the intergenerational facets of that. Yeah. I think that's a really important thing nowadays too. Like just looking around at wars that are going on in the planet and I look at them and I say to myself, well, hey, I'm incredibly lucky as a, a man. I never had to fight in a war. And secondly, well, we're just breeding a whole new generation of traumatized people. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, though, if you think about the impact that talking or not talking about uh, trauma and, and experiences can have on people and family life. You know, if you if you look back to, to the situation with your father, if he felt able to talk about his experiences and explain to you why he was traumatized and you then felt more encouraged to explain to him how you were feeling about things, things could be so much so, so different. You know, the, the importance of being able to talk and share things can totally transform relationships. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we can see that with uh, 
number of people who go to counselling these days or mm. speak to psychologists or are encouraged to talk about their issues. And you're absolutely right. I mean, none of that none of that stuff was anything I ever spoke to my father about. He didn't know how to talk to me about it and I didn't know how to ask him about it. Mm. And it just uh, lay there. And my mother a bit, as I've already said, but even with her, she was kind of reluctant and quite... Um, withdrawn in many respects you mm. would but only given the right kind of encouragement but i i agree with you actually on that point a few years ago um when I, I was an academic for a while and i wrote a book about men called the hearts of men which was a lot of interviews with men and at that time there was this currency in the culture that men could not talk about their feelings. Oh, men, they can't talk about their emotions and their their feelings. I understand why people say that. Um, I understand, you know, in a sense, that's what I'm saying about my father, except that I don't think it's true if you ask them. I mean, my yeah. experience was if I sat down with men and they included a, a number of men who'd been soldiers, I made a point of that, of, of talking to men like that, if you ask them and you ask the right questions and you do it in a way that is sympathetic and open and honest and genuine, I, I honestly believe men will talk about their feelings and about those things. So I don't think it's only that men can't talk about them. I think if they're not asked or they're not given the opportunity to or it's not expected of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they do so. But yes, you know, I think in our culture nowadays, talking is, um, you know, talking cure, isn't it? All the way back to Freud. Mm. So we're encouraged much more to do that. In all honesty, uh, <laughs> I don't want to turn this interview into a counselling system. <laughs> no, absolutely. But, uh, I don't think I was ever the greatest father either, actually, and I think that was a carryover from my own family. But I definitely try to talk to my children, and I think my relationship now with my children is probably more open and honest and talkable than um, my own relationship with my father. So mm -hmm. I made a point at a certain point of trying to explain to my own children why I some of my behavior was also not quite what they might have liked. Yeah. Oh, well, well done you. That's a mate. You broke a pattern. That's really good. I hope so. That was certainly my <laughs> intention. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, it's been lovely chatting with you. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris Barker. If people want to get a copy of the book, it's called Hungry Ghosts and it's available on our website, tre.radio. Where does the title come from, Chris? Hungry Ghosts. It's actually a term that from Buddhist philosophy, and it refers to, in Buddhist uh, mythology, creatures with a very, very long necks. And so the more they, and they're hungry, and the more they try to eat, the, le they, the less they can get down their necks. Their necks are so thin they can't actually get what they need. So it's a metaphor, and it's a metaphor for a sense of lack and for a sense of never being satisfied with what you have, mm. always chasing, chasing, chasing after other things. So uh, many of the characters in the novel are continually chasing something. Their dissatisfaction with life leads them to constantly be chasing and never happy with what they've got. My sense of that and the term, or my use of that term comes from the idea in a sense that people who have been traumatized are hungry ghosts. Yeah. They are restless and unhappy and not able to settle as a consequence of their, of their traumatized life. Really. Mm. Wow. Powerful stuff. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome. Thank you for uh, talking to me. Talk Radio Europe. The TRE Book Show is sponsored by audible.co.uk. Download one title each month, plus unlimited listening to thousands of Audible originals, podcasts, and audiobooks. Just click on the Audible banner at www.tre.radio. The Book Programme. Presented by Hannah Murray.
Joining us on the line now is Nick McLaughlin. He grew up in Derby, where his debut novel Slings and Arrows is set. After university, he trained to become a teacher, but instead escaped to the French Alps to go skiing. He's with us on the book show to talk about Slings and Arrows, which follows the life of 45-year-old Terry, who finds unlikely success with his local amateur darts team. It's a funny novel focusing on the lives of an ordinary group of people in in the East Midlands and asks us to consider what matters most in life. Welcome to the book show, Nick. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Uh, it's, Thanks, great. it's great to have you with us. So there's a, a bit of a kind of backstory to this. You were kind of inspired to start writing a bit after the death of your father. That's correct. Yes, I think I think like a lot of people, um, I'd always wanted to write a book and then life as it does gets in the way, um, job, two kids, things like that. Uh, and probably the truth is I was afraid also to fail. I never sat down and started because um, I was concerned that I wouldn't be able to do it. And then um, my father died and I realised at that moment that if I didn't at least have a go, then I would regret it. So I signed up with um, Faber Academy a few months later and uh, did a course with them, a short course, and I really, really enjoyed that. The people were excellent. The um, the other, my colleagues on the course were really supportive. And uh, that just gave me the urge to um, think that maybe uh, yeah, I could perhaps have a go. I could, I could write a little bit. Um, so I applied for their longer course, which is a six-month writing a novel course, and you had to provide them with some writing and they accepted me on that course and it sort of took off from there. Yeah. Great. And there's a lovely anecdote about your dad, which uh, you, the initial idea for the novel came from. I know you didn't end up using the anecdote in the book, but can you share it with us? Because it's such a lovely story. Yes, that's right. Um well, it was an anecdote that I had heard once many, many years ago. And then following my father's uh, death, somebody uh, repeated it to me. Uh, he and his friend, um, his very close friend, used to fish together. And neither of them had a great deal of money. And um, his friend was struggling for cash and actually sold his fishing gear to a local uh, fishing tackle shop. And um, when my father found out, he actually went to the shop and bought the kit back and gave it back to his friend. Even though he didn't have a lot of money either, he said, no, this is, uh, you know, fishing is something that you love to do. It's a passion of yours. You, you can't sell your kit. Oh, that's um, so lovely. It is. It, it touched me and it it made me, it sort of got me thinking about male friendship, something um, that we don't talk enormously about. You know, guys are not particularly good at sharing their emotions or what they think about one another. And that was almost a gesture um, of love, if you like, and of friendship without um, without having to say the words, I suppose. And that, yeah. that's what inspired me to write. Yeah, really special. So darts, why darts? <laughs> <laughs> that's another really good question. I, I, for two reasons, I suppose. One is it's a convenient vehicle to bring uh, a group of men together to explore the theme of male friendship. I think that's one of the things. The second thing is I've always loved the theater of darts. I just find it uh, so entertaining to watch. And it always has been uh, that the characters on the stage, the music, the costumes, the crowd play a part. They're encouraged to play a part. It's almost like Panto. And I yeah. thought it's really going to give me something to work with uh, in the scenes of the book. I thought I could see some of the scenes set in pubs um with with characters and um yeah it would it would be an interesting topic to cover and as i say i've, I've i do enjoy the game I've, I've loved it for a long time and so it brought the guys together yeah. that was the reason and what about the the setting or the time period why the early 80s mm. yeah um i suppose i heard uh, i heard somebody i think it was kazuo ishiguro say in one of his speeches that his first novel he was trying to in a way capture something before it was lost. And I suppose in 1982, when the novel is set, it takes place over one year. I was 13 
I had a good, uh, terrific relationship with my father at the time, and um, we played cricket together and, and and different things. We also went fishing together, and I suppose um, at thirteen years of age, it, it was a time um, when all seemed well in the world, um, and I wanted to sort of recapture that time. Uh, then looking once I started writing, there's a lot to work with. You've got obviously Margaret Thatcher. You've got the unemployment issues. War with Argentina, great television at the time, uh, food. You, you know, it was really enjoyable in the end, revisiting that time. Yeah, nice. So did you did you do a lot of research on, on the internet or did you kind of look back over old photos and things to remind yourself? Oh, yeah, that's a both, definitely. That was almost, that was the real fun part of writing. You know, writing's very, I, f- I find it really difficult. Um, so sitting down to write is, is, uh, is tough, but yeah, the, the, the research of the, of the setting and the time is a real fun bit. And yeah. I get to, I got to watch old episodes of uh, Juliet Bravo and, uh, <laughs> the gentle touch and, and, and things like that from back in the, back in the eighties, which was really fun. Great. So tell us about the, the pub that you use, White Hart. Yeah, again, it's, uh, you know, typically English, uh, British name for a pub. And I was looking for one. Um, my dad had a local. Uh, in those days, many people had a local where they went in and, and knew everybody there. And the people behind the bar knew them. They were very loyal to that pub often. They might have gone to other pubs, but that was the that was the place they went back to. And I wanted to create that kind of uh, situation somewhere um, where the the people in the novel, the characters in the novel would, would walk in and, and know the people uh, around the bar, the barmaids and, and the other people in the pub. Yeah, real community feel. Absolutely, yeah, that's it. And tell us about the characters then in the novel. So Terry, the main character, is uh, is a blue-collar worker. He's been working the same job since he left school and, and is made redundant. Um, he's got a good heart. He's sort of old-fashioned values of work and family and things like that. Um, and then he's found redu- uh, made redundant and he and his wife are then forced to move out of their home family home and into a static caravan they're struggling for cash um and it's that all the characters in the book they're they're ordinary people they're they're you and me they're normal people it's not a genre novel i wanted to really study um the everyday life of, of regular characters the people that i grew up with people around me at the time and around my parents so there are lots of um themes around family and, and friendship and troubles that we all go through in life, I suppose, illness, infidelity, you know, the struggle to conceive one of the characters, things like that. Mm. So all the the men have got their, their own kind of issues going on with or, or without partners and, and all that kind of thing. They do. But as is often the case, uh, I think it's certainly at that time, and I still believe it today it's it's the women in the novel um that glue everything together i hope um pat uh, terry's wife is a nurse she um she's the rock in the family um she takes everything in her stride she's a great listener so although the the guys the the, the men in the novel find it difficult to open up to one another they all are quite comfortable chatting to pat and um yeah it's it's her and the other women in the novel um, that are uh, the, the the glue. Mm. So the story is told from whose point of view then? It's told. For, it's the third person uh, close to Terry. Essentially, um, every every three or four chapters, I I drop in a chapter from um, looking at the life of, of a couple of the other members of the darts team, Phil and and um, and another member of the team. So, but mainly it follows Terry, yeah. Mm. And how do you feel now you've finished the book and it's out there? Are you kind of having a bit of a breather or are you already wanting to to crack on with another book? I am actually about halfway through another novel. Um, so yeah, at the moment I'm I'm cracking on with that and I'm nervous and about the, the, you know, my first this novel, Slings and Arrows, coming out. You know, as I say, it's my debut. Um, it's exposing, I suppose. You know, it's the first time I've done anything like this. 
so yeah nervous and excited at the same time I would say yeah and your next book is it something completely different or a similar kind of subjects no it is a little bit different yes it's um it's it's about truth and about what you believe I suppose it's about a young boy um in a children's home who is accused of pushing another boy off a roof and because the adults for one reason or another around him tell him that he did it he believes that he did and the novel is going to explore how he comes to find out the truth and how that enables him to reconnect with his mother Wow, that sounds good. Well, in the meantime, if listeners want to get a copy of Slings and Arrows, it's out now. It's available on our website, tre.radio, and it's by Nick McLaughlin, who we've been chatting with. Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been lovely. Thanks ever so much, Hannah. The Book Programme, presented by Hannah Murray. Joining us on the line now is Ashley Wright. He's a novelist and author who holds a first-class honours degree in history and a master's degree in the same field, graduating in 2020. A lover of sci-fi and fantasy with a long affinity for the past, he begins his literary journey with his action-packed debut novel, Hella's Angels. It's a historic fantasy young adult novel following Leo Avery, a young boy who finds himself drawn into a battle against monsters in the midst of the Second World War. Welcome to the book show, Ashley. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you with us. And congratulations, your debut novel. Very exciting. Uh, thanks. It's uh, It's been a long time uh, in, the, in the making. Thank you. Oh, so uh, it was a kind of obvious, I guess, to you that you wanted to write some kind of historical fiction. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I was first... Uh, thinking about what period of history to to set the book in i had a lot of thoughts on that see when it comes to history i'm more of a of a generalist i suppose i i, I find it difficult to settle on one period in in particular for like for my undergraduate degree i was i focused on um the first world war my dissertation and then for my masters i moved to the middle ages but i suppose when it comes to World War Two, I was sort of I was drawn in by. I suppose it's it's something that I've always been interested in. Possibly just because I mean the amount of games and films and TV that that are about that are focus on that period out there. Yeah, and I think I mean m- most of all, and what I love to write the most, and what World War Two provides is that you know action and uh, the battles and things like that. And uh, where does the the fantasy side come into it then? I suppose that's more just because I've always been into sci-fi and fantasy. And I think it gives you a sort of a, a creativity. Like when when I was uh, first looking into writing uh, fiction, I wanted to move away more from the academic side of, of writing because, I mean, the... A history degree is a lot of writing and I wanted to move away from that and move and sort of bring my creativity and imagination in, into my writing and sci-fi I think can definitely do that. <laughs> you have a lot of freedom I guess with sci-fi because you can you can make so much up you can create your own world can't you? Exactly exactly and I think when it comes to World War II as well there's a side of the conflict that's just so surreal yet factual and it's sort of perfect for that uh inspiration it's uh, i mean in my opinion it's it's the gift that keeps on giving really you've got ufo sightings for your, your more classic sci-fi the huge leaps forward in, in technology especially with things like uh, you know your sci-fi things like rocketry atomic research uh, and even the, the supernatural as well. There's, if you look at the, the Nazis' relationship uh, with the occult, uh, secret societies and all kinds of weird sort of pseudoscience. I mean, these these are things that sci-fi in nature, but are grounded in fact, although mm. they have been sort of distorted down the years by sort of conspiracy theorists and things like that. But they, they definitely provide a real good inspiration for, for sci-fi. Yeah. So tell us about your main character, Leo. Well, he's a 16-year-old boy. His father's gone missing uh, during the Blitz. Uh, so the book's set in 1943, so that's, that's two years after the Blitz. And 
one night, he, without giving too much away, one night he does he encounters a, a sort of strange sort of creature uh, that he's attacked by, but he is saved by a, a sort of mysterious group that are known as the Angels, who use powers or abilities that they they call echoes to hunt monsters. And uh, these monsters are called Dreadfowl. And the angels aren't the only ones interested in in the Dreadfowl. The Sealer Society, uh, that's inspired by uh, some of the the secret societies of of, uh, of the Nazis and the uh, Second World War, they want to open a gateway to the uh, the home world of the Dreadfowl in order to use them to create an army. Uh, only Leo and the angels can stop them, so uh, they're really up against it. While Leo's looking for his dad as well at the same time, so it's it's not a it's not a good time for him. I feel no. bad for the guy. <laughs> so are there, has he got friends kind of helping him? Are there are there other characters with him? He certainly does. I really wanted a, a sort of close knit group of characters. Like the main theme, I suppose, of the book is is family and um, acceptance. So I suppose the, he is at the beginning forced into it somewhat, but he comes to sort of uh, appreciate them for as friends and as family. Um, and there's a sort of, there is a family dynamic with as a mother-like figure in, in glass. She's quite something. She's very different to what you'd think of when you think of a, a 1940s uh, woman. She's a very strong physically and as a person. But she is also quite a motherly figure to Leo. And then there's Oscar and Alex and Azumi, who are more the brothers and sisters. And then obviously there's the, the father, Dr. Hella, who is, well, he's quite cold and aloof, but secretly deep down, he, he really cares about his, uh, his angels. Mm. So do we like the angels? We do, we do. <laughs> uh, they're, they're sort of the the heroes of the story. Um, the villains would be the Sealer Society, uh, who are led by a, a one hunter Colonel Kramer, and uh, there's also a, a um, one of the human dreadfowl hybrids, the first of, it, of its kind, called Adler, who is sort of, I suppose, also the main villain as well, but. Yeah, again, I don't really want to give too much away, you know, with the spoilers. Yeah, no, fair enough. So is this kind of setting itself up to be the first in a series, do you think? I mean, uh, that would be ideal. <laughs> I'd love that to be the case. I've got ideas uh, for for more things, uh, for more books as well. And the way the book ends, I, I'd, I'd, I try to leave it kind of open-ended to allow that to be the case it would be nice but well i suppose we'll have to see how this goes first of all yeah well good luck with it all if people want to get a copy of hella's angels it's out now it's available on our website tre.radio and it's by ashley wright who we've been chatting with today ashley thanks so much for joining us thanks for having me hannah it's been great the book program presented by hannah murray The TRE Book Show is sponsored by audible.co.uk. Download one title each month, plus unlimited listening to thousands of Audible originals, podcasts and audiobooks. Just click on the Audible banner at www.tre.radio. You've been listening to a TRE production. If you've enjoyed this program, there'll be another episode waiting for you next week, right here on this platform, where you can also access our extensive back catalogue of shows and interviews. For more information on our live programming, social media channels and apps, and how to contact Talk Radio Europe, please visit tre.radio.